thank my lovely wife for that wonderful message of peace. I did notice something, you know, you know, the part where she was talking about, let's be careful that we don't preach heresy. When she was making that point, she was looking dead at me, so I have to be very careful. <laughs> The title of my message is continuing the same theme that Gloria talked about. My title is Passion for the Peace Bringer. And I'm going to restate our theme yet again. Our theme is Jesus brings peace and we are to be his peacemakers. You know, if Jesus is the bringer of peace, that means that there's no true peace apart from Jesus. And if we are to be his peacemakers, that means we must enthusiastically and passionately follow his example of bringing peace. Right? Now peace, when you think about it, it is something that we can get excited about. It's a very vital part of our existence. The human existence has to have peace, both individually, you know, in our own minds and hearts and souls, but also collectively as a group, we have to have peace. As Gloria was talking about, the unity, the mutual acceptance, all those components that make up peace. Yet, as she stated, peace in this world is either in very short supply or is practically non-existent. Every day throughout the world, we experience war, we experience strife, we experience conflict, drama, chaos, distress, anxiety, and seemingly everything that's the opposite of peace, going in the total opposite direction of true peace. But God did not create us to be like that. He did not create us to live our lives like that. All these negative things, this list I just went through, those are harmful. Those are destructive to our lives. Those are destructive to our body, our soul, our spirit. They're destructive to the total whole person, spiritual and physical. Now, Jesus is passionate about being the solution to the problems that mankind encounters, but of ourselves we're unable to resolve. So that means Jesus is excited to bring peace. Therefore, we should be just as excited to share Jesus. In Isaiah 9, verse 6, the prophet Isaiah, uh, this is a very familiar scripture to us, and we know that in that passage, the prophet Isaiah foretells the first coming of Jesus to earth, born as a human baby. And here's the prophecy and some of the divine roles he would fulfill. And Isaiah 9, verse 6 reads like this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's the Old Testament version. Let's go to the New Testament. And we look at Luke, the second chapter. Luke chapter 2. In that passage, we read the account of the angelic announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus had just been born and the story tells us in verse 8 of Luke chapter 2 and I'm going to read to verse 12 right now. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, should you like to check this out. <clears throat> you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So we see right here, an angel comes into the shepherd's just minding their own business, taking care of their flocks, scaring them half to death until he assures them, do not be afraid, have great news. And he's announcing the birth of Jesus and how they can see his birth, witness it for themselves. 
continuing chapter 2, verses 13 to 14, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those to whom his favor rests. Now, the angel's been talking to them and all of a sudden coming behind him as if on cue, an angelic choir appears, probably the hard, largest, largest choir ever seen in the universe. And they're singing praise to God. And if you notice in verse 14, they connect the birth of Jesus to the prospect of peace on earth. Now let's look at verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. All right. So what happens after this amazing heavenly display? What was the response of the shepherds? What did they do? Did they say, uh, well, yeah, yeah, whatever, that's nice, you know. Now let's go back to shuffling sheep dung like we were doing before. Did they say that? No. They were excited. They said, this is awesome. Let's go see all of this for ourselves. They were excited. They were passionate. So verse 16 and 20, they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And verse 20 says, The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. In their excitement, the shepherds hurried off in search of Mary and Joseph and the baby. You know, you know, you think about it. Here it is late at night. You know, they had to kind of probably go through Bethlehem looking at, you know, places of mangers. It probably took them a while to find them. They probably said, you go there, you go there, let us know what you find. But their enthusiastic searching paid off, right? Afterwards, they spread the word. Guess what we saw? Guess what we found? And all who heard them, the scripture says, were amazed. Perhaps it was their enthusiasm and excitement. Perhaps they were so contagious that it, 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 it just generated interest in all those that heard the message, right? Now, verse 20 said the shepherds returned. And I think that means they went back to their regular shepherding duties and responsibilities afterwards. But they were different. They were not just simply shepherds anymore. They had become on fire evangelists for Jesus. Now, this story is just one of several in which we see uh, encounters with Jesus and his peace and how those who encounter him become excited and compassionate and, and passionate to share him. It would be wonderful to say that this is the case 100% of the time, but sadly we know that that's not always the result. You know, There's a joke along those lines and it goes like this. Jesus went into the mountains with his disciples and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the peacemakers, and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And Peter said, will this be on the final exam? And Philip said, wait, were we supposed to write this down? And James said, I don't have a pen. Bartholomew said, uh, did the other disciples have to learn this? And Judas said, when will we ever need this in real life? And then some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, may we see your lesson plan? Was the learning objective clearly communicated to all students? Was there a range of differentiated outcomes according to the identified levels of ability of each student? And can you show that you have used a variety of teaching strategies according to the different learning models. And Jesus wept. <laughs> Although this is a joke, 
it illustrates that there are some who encounter Jesus. They may taste of the peace of Jesus, and they don't get it. They don't get it. They don't receive it. And they don't pass it along. So it kind of stops with them. Yet, as I said earlier, the story of the shepherds is just one part of several where the people do get it. Okay? Simply put, it goes like this. When you encounter the Prince of Peace, you develop a passion to share the Prince of Peace. When you encounter the Prince of Peace, you develop a passion to share the Prince of Peace. Here's another example, and that's the encounter with, of Jesus with the Samaritan woman. We're familiar with that's, that's the, that uh, conversation, which is found in John chapter 4. I won't go through it, but I will recap the uh, high, highlights of this as it applies to our, our uh, points here. You know, it seems that when you read the encounters and, Jesus, and, and, the, and the woman's comments about Jesus, you get the impression that she was most impressed that Jesus could tell her everything she ever did. That seems like that's how she proclaimed him to the others. But I believe there was so much more involved in that. This is just a, a you know, brief uh, story of, the, of something, a much longer conversation. By the way, if you've seen the movie series The Chosen, there is one episode where Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman. I think it's a beautiful way how they tell that story and show the interaction between Jesus and a Samaritan woman in The Chosen. So I highly recommend that series, if you've, even just for that episode alone. But there was something about Jesus that gave her hope. For example, Jesus spoke to her about worship, and Gloria was talking about worship uh, earlier. Now, when Jesus spoke to her about worship, it wasn't in separating Jews from the Samaritans. It was in uniting them both in spirit and in truth, remember? Gloria talked about how Jesus wants us to promote peace by accepting one another just as he has accepted us. And here is a clear example. You see, the Samaritan woman was a cast off. I mean, it's bad enough that Jews and Samaritans don't talk, so she naturally she could not even try to fit into Jewish society. But we kind of understand from her story that she was a cast off even in her own society, even in her own area. But in meeting with Jesus, the Jewish Savior who assured her that he was her Messiah, she felt love, she felt acceptance, and she felt a newfound peace that she had never experienced before. That filled her heart with joy so completely that she had to spread the news about Jesus immediately to others in her hometown. You know, she came with her water pot to get water. She just dropped it and took off. She said, I got to tell my people about this. And her testimony was so compelling and everybody who heard it were amazed. So much so that she brought a lot of those people to Jesus directly, right? And when they heard him, they were even more amazed. Her testimony was amazement step one, but then they meet Jesus, and it, the amazement just goes off the charts. The Samaritan woman had become a passionate evangelist for Jesus. See, that's the second example. And of course, the, problem, the most prominent example, you know, Jesus worked all kinds of miracles. He met all kinds of people healing and different signs and wonders that he um, showed through those, and also his messages to the crowds that he was the Christ, that he was the Messiah. But even more than that, probably the most prominent example of Jesus performing the work of his peace ministry uh, was the training and commissioning of his 12 disciples. They were just a ragtag bunch of guys, you know. But they became apostles sent to the four corners of the known world in order to spread the love of Jesus and to spread the gospel of peace. The scripture has been mentioned earlier today. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That's John 14, 27. You know, many people claim they know the way to peace, but scripture says that man does not. Only God knows. Man wants to promote peace based on his own agenda apart from God. So it's win for one side, lose for the other. 
But if you leave it to God, it's win-win. He dies for all of us so that we can all be one to him and uh, have a relationship with the Prince of Peace. And the other scripture says, uh, another scripture about Jesus talking about peace. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's John 16, 33. That means that the peace in Christ is far greater than the trouble in the world. Okay, so we have these and other scriptures throughout the Bible. They're affirming and they're reaffirming that Jesus is the bringer of true peace. Now, with this, if Jesus is passionate and Jesus is excited, enthusiastic about bringing peace to the world, how then do we who follow Jesus find our passion and enthusiasm to participate in his ministry of peace? I'm just going to put it this way. There may be a literally a thousand ways we can do this. The examples that I cited earlier were of those who literally preached Christ, right? They went about throughout the hills and valleys and countrysides, whatever, their hometowns, sharing the message about Jesus the way we would imagine an evangelist or preacher would do it, right? But their examples, this is important, their examples do not represent the only way we share Jesus. The Great Commission in Matthew says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. Well, today, especially thanks to technology, there are many ways that one can go into all the world, and there are many ways that we can preach the gospel to everyone. We are not limited to one method for fulfilling the commission. So, how do we find our passion? Your passion will come from your personal testimony. And your passion will be expressed through the talents and the gifts and the abilities that God has specifically given to you to use in advancing his kingdom. So it's your testimony and it's your gifts and talents put together. You see, we don't need to compare ourselves with the great preachers and think, well, they're spreading the gospel and we're not. No. You might not be able to speak well. And you might not even have the personality of an extrovert who just loves to speak, right? Well, don't worry. God has called you, every one of you in this room, everyone on Zoom, all Christians, specifically to do what you have uniquely been placed in the body to do. So you be yourself. And you serve Him passionately with the gifts and the talents he gives you individually. And if you look and pray and ask God's guidance, he will show you some of those thousands of ways that you can do this and be, uh, be participating. As long as you do it passionately, God says, whatever you do, do it with all your might. You know, do it to the Lord. Do it in service to him. If it's praying, if it's writing supporting letters, if it's helping teach little kids, you know, whatever it is. You don't have to go out there and stand on a pulpit in order to fulfill the Great Commission. I love quoting this quote, and I, I, don't, I don't know if I ever get it completely right, but it's preach the gospel any way you can, and if necessary, use words, you know. That's how it is. Sometimes your example is enough, but if you are passionately in love with Jesus, it's going to show in everything you do and what you say, how you deal with pressure, how you deal with the vicissitudes of life, as it were, okay? All of those are going to come to bear, and that's part of your testimony, and that's part of how you show your love for God. Now, this is on the basis that you have encountered the peace of God, and that you have received it. So I want to tell you, all of us have received the peace of God. If you are in Christ, you are receiving the peace of God. Here's how you can know that. Let me give you several points on that. First of all, you're loved by God. God loves you so much that he died so that you can live forever. That's the first point. 
The second one is your salvation is secure in his unchanging hands. You don't need to doubt your salvation. He said, I tell you these things so that you can know that you have eternal life. Now, either you know it or you don't. God says you can know it. So where are you? Okay. Your salvation is secure in his unchanging hands. The next point. Your service to him is making a difference even if you don't see how. Your service to him, you know, folding up chairs, you know, whatever the little things that you do. God said, this is, uh, I see what you're doing and it's making a difference. And the, this goes to the next point. Even the little things God asks you to do are very important to him, you know. He might not ask you to stand in front of 100,000 people to preach, you know. He might say, just go pray with this one person. That is just as important for God's give, God's command to you as the other person he commands to preach because he gave you the opportunity to pray for that one person and that's helping advance the kingdom. So never dismiss uh, the little things because you think, oh God, I want to do something bigger. No, do those little things and God says, this is important to me. You're giving a glass of cold water to somebody in my name and you will be blessed. If you sin, this is the next point, if you sin, confess it. God will forgive. He will not condemn. He's not out there looking for reasons to zap you every day if you fall short. So confess your sin. And he will forgive you and pick you up and you'll go forward. In everything you are going through, God is always with you. In everything you're going through, God is always with you. That's another thing to know. And finally, keep your eyes on Jesus and he will give you the victory. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He will give you the victory. This is all part of, and there's so much more, but this is part of the peace that we have in God. That's true peace. Nobody on earth, no man can give you this peace. This is the peace that comes from God. So I want to wrap up our uh, discussion of Romans 15 that we started earlier by looking at verse 13, which wraps up our thought for today's theme. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. There's hope, joy, and peace. And if you believe you've lost the passion to serve Jesus, ask him to restore that passion to you. Ask the Holy Spirit to reawaken in your heart. You know, Paul talks about stirring up the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we may, you know, kind of let it lie dormant. But ask God to restore that, to rekindle the fire of passion. And ask God if you feel like you don't have this peace, if somehow you feel out that you get disconnected, just ask Him, God, please help me restore your peace in my heart. The Son of God who inspired the shepherds, who inspired the Samaritan woman, who inspired the disciples, has continued to inspire millions throughout the centuries. And today he is inspiring you and me. He has passionately given us his peace. Let us respond by giving him our passionate devotion and service. Amen.